Well, straight to the action on the last street where the markets did witness a sharp recovery in the second half after weak global queues translated to a weak start. So the Nifty reclaiming 10,900. This after a gap down opening, the Sensex recovered more than 300 points coming off the intraday lows, ending with gains of one-fifth of a percent. Broader markets outperformed slightly, while the bank Nifty rallied about half a percent. That was the story in the equity markets. But in the currency space, the rupee ended at its highest level since November 30th. The domestic unit ended at 70.44 to the dollar. This against Monday's close of 71.54. This is the rupee's biggest single session gain in over five years. So that was the story for the currency. In a bid to boost liquidity in the system, the Reserve Bank of India has decided to scale up its purchase of government securities. Why the open market operation group? Two auctions in December have been scaled up by 30,000 crore rupees. This will take the total bond purchases to 50,000 crores. And a similar auction will be undertaken in the month of January. So stepping up on the OMO, that's the RBI. And the rupee rally was a result of a fall in crude oil prices, which tanked for the third straight day. So if you take a look at the reports of swelling inventories and forecasts of a record US and Russian output combined with a sharp global market sell-off, taking a toll on crude prices. So Brent trading at 58.67, down by about a percent and a half, and NYMEX down 2% at 48.83. Well, one of the big stories that we're tracking tonight. I was not the Prime Minister who was afraid to talk to the press. That's the word in from former Fi Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. In what seems to have been a whale dig at his successor, Narendra Modi, the former Prime Minister said that he never shied away from talking to the press as Prime Minister. Speaking at the launch of his five-volume book, Changing India, Manmohan Singh also talked about the recent controversies with respect to GDP data, the appointment of a new RBI governor and the resignation of Urjit Patel and farm loan waivers, the clamor for that which is being led by the Congress party. He said the release of GDP data should not have been done by people who do not have the requisite expertise, basically pointing to the fact that the Niti Aayog should not have been involved with the announcement. Take a look. People say I was a silent prime minister. I think this, these volumes speak for themselves and I don't want to boast about my goals or my achievements as the Prime Minister, but the events that took place are well described in this, these volumes, particularly the volume which deals with the Prime Minister speaks. I certainly would like to say that I was not the Prime Minister who was afraid of talking to the press. I met the press regularly and on every foreign trip that I undertook, I had a press conference on return in the plane or after, immediately after landing. I think it's not proper that when releasing the G GDP numbers, I think there should be people who have no expertise sitting on the table along with the statistician. So I think the, that the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission was the one who was announcing these n new d numbers. That reduces the credibility of this exercise. What about the working of the RBI, sir? You've seen the government so closely, you've seen the financial sector so closely, the crisis within I the RBI. I think one has to respect the autonomy and independence of the Reserve Bank. At the same time, I would say that the relation between the government and the Reserve Bank is like the husband and wife relationship. Mm. There will be hiccups, there will be differences of opinion, but ultimately, these must be harmonized in a manner mm. that the two great institutions of the government and the Reserve Bank mm. can work in harmony with each other. headlines coming in from the political economy space. Congress President Rahul Gandhi has promised a nationwide farm loan waiver if voted to power and Prime Minister Modi has promised to prune the 28% GST slab just days ahead of the GST Council meet. Now let's first take a look at the loan waiver promise. A day after newly elected Congress governments both in Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh waived off farm loans 
which means that they have signed off on the process to waive off farm loans. Rahul Gandhi has now promised a nationwide loan waiver. Speaking in Parliament, Gandhi said he will not let the Prime Minister sleep or rest till he waves off loans of farmers. In just the last couple of years, seven states have announced large-scale farm loan waivers to the tune of over 2 lakh crore rupees. Before we get into the discussion and the debate on that, here's Rahul Gandhi's loan waiver pitch. I want to tell you here, कि कांग्रेस पार्टी और बाकी सब विपक्ष की पार्टी एक होकर नरेंद्र मोदी से कर्जा माफ करके ही दिखाएगी हम खड़े होंगे हम उनसे लड़ेंगे एक इंच पीछे नहीं हटेंगे उनको सोने नहीं देंगे रात भर सोने नहीं देंगे जब तक हिंदुस्तान के किसान का कर्जा माफ नहीं होगा 2019 का चुनाव सामने आप तो कह रहे हैं मोदी सरकार करवा लेंगे लेकिन अगर नहीं हो पाया तो क्या नहीं, वो तो ये प्रमुख वादा होगा वो, कि आप वो, लोकसभा चुनाव में उसके तो, अंदर माफ करेंगे देखिए ये तो आप मतलब ये कैसा सवाल पूछ रहे हो ये तो मतलब गारंटीड हंड्रेड परसेंट अगर मोदी जी नहीं कराएंगे तो हम कराएंगे अब हम नरेंद्र मोदी पर ऐसा दबाव डालेंगे और सिर्फ कांग्रेस पार्टी नहीं सिर्फ कांग्रेस पार्टी नहीं हिंदुस्तान का हर किसान एक को नहीं छोड़ने वाले हम आप सबको लेकर हम कर्जा माफ करवाएंगे we will not let the prime minister sleep till he announces a national loan waiver for farmers across the country that's rahul gandhi from rahul gandhi to the prime minister speaking at an event in mumbai the prime minister has promised a simpler gst regime and gone on to say that 99% of items will soon be under the 18% tax slab or below that the congress party has been clamoring for pruning the 28% tax slab in fact just last week we reported that congress finance ministers and non bjp members of the gst council were likely to hold a huddle ahead of the weekend meeting of the GST council we now have 14 non bjp members in the council which has a total strength of 31 we also understand that big ticket rate cuts are unlikely in the upcoming council meeting at least that is the recommendation of the cbic officials but remember this is going to be a political call that will be taken on saturday that's the 22nd when the gst council meets remember centre and the states are both worried about the monthly gst revenue collections which continue to be below the government's asking rate in this fiscal we've crossed the 1 lakh crore rupee mark only once in september so the question now is is there room for significant gst rate rationalization joining us now to discuss both the issues the agrarian uh, economy as well as what we should expect from the gst council meet uh, manpreet singh badal finance minister of punjab thomas isaac finance minister of kerala gentlemen appreciate you joining us here on the program mr badal let me start by asking you and i'll pick up on the simpler of the two issues and that has to deal with the gst council meeting on the 22nd the agenda i believe has been circulated we've heard from the prime minister today saying that that 99% of the items will be in the 18% slab or below further pruning of the 28% bracket is warranted uh, the congress party has demanded uh, always that there should be one single rate and you have said that it should be capped at 18% now given the reality today political as well as economic the economic reality is that we're still below the asking rate of over 1 lakh crore rupees in terms of monthly gst revenue collections but the political reality is that three big states have been lost by the bjp do you believe that in the meeting of the gst council on the 22nd we could see significant rate rationalization being announced well shireen i want to start on a lighter note Uh, you are probably looking at one of the most uh, worried human beings in the indian subcontinent next only to mr asad umar who is the finance minister of pakistan because he has to pay back 32 billion dollars uh, next year uh, but having said that uh, i i must confess that the design of the gst and congress has been saying it ever since the first meeting in sirinagar uh, it's a bad design and once its uh, gst is designed badly it's very very difficult to fix it and uh, what the prime minister mm. has announced today and uh, i would take exception to that because uh, uh, whether rates need to be cut or you know some rates need to be increased or whatever that is not the prerogative of the yeah prime minister that is the prerogative of the yeah. gst council the agenda has GST not been circulated um gst council because we have pooled in our sovereignty all states and uh, the center together uh, but i have seen uh, in the last uh, one and a half year since uh, gst has been uh, has started in india that uh, i've seen it during the gujarat elections 
and I have seen it in other elections and now I think the government is on a, in a election mode. So, but I personally feel that the GST council should not be a forum of populist policies. And if there are any rate cuts, mm. Congress has been advocated against the 28% slab. But then a holistic view must be taken. Mr. Thomas Isaac, do you believe the time is right for further rate rationalization? And I don't mean tinkering. I mean moving cement out of the 28% slab down to 18%, for instance, which has been the, the, one of the big asks. In light of what you've heard from the Prime Minister t today, do you believe that the GST Council, uh, the centre, will push significant rationalization, if at all? Now, the story of GST in India has become a story of uh, knee-jerk reactions to uh, whatever happens uh, just before the meeting of the GST Council. And now, you may have different opinion, but after very long deliberations, a rest, rate structure was uh, created. And now, uh, if you are going to change the rate structure, it must be after very serious deliberations. When agenda is circulated sufficiently early, I find when Piyush Goyal was mm. the, uh, in fact chairing it, uh, it was not intimated that they are going to discuss the rate structure. In fact, I was absent in that, com in that council and you find um, a massive slashing of rates from 28 to 18 and so on. Now, yeah. Yeah. I have always supported this four-rate structure. I never support a one-rate structure. Reason is simple. In India, mm. though there are commodities that very, very poor people consume. They should be rated at very low rate yeah. or exempted. And there are commodities which are not that mm. essential, which are the consumer durables and so on. Mm. Well, traditional tax system, pre-GST system, they were suffering a rate anything between 35% to 45%. They were all reduced to effective yeah. rate of 28%. Now you are reducing to 18%. Hmm. Now this is what, there is something called distribution. The distributive impact of a tax. You read the canons, um, the canons of taxation, they will teach you first. Yeah. You have to look at the distributive impact. Yes. Yes. Now, what is the distributive impact of the reduction? It's becoming more iniquitous. They're, the richer people are let off, and the poor people, their burdens are not reduced. This is just not right. So, so, now, so particularly my simple, when my simple point, your sir. overall revenue no, my, my, has been my far simple below. Question. My, yes. In that context, my simple question, since the overall GST revenue collection has been below the asking rate, if the centre, uh, through the Fitment Committee, were to come up with significant rate rationalisation on the 22nd, what are states going to say? What will you say, Mr Isaac? Well, uh, I oppose it. I oppose it for the simple reason. You will oppose it? This is not revenue neutral rate. The what structure today that takes us... Mm. Yes, the, the what structure that exists today is not revenue neutral. And uh, you see, Kerala is a state which is committed to large-scale social spending. And um, our revenues must grow at least mm. by something around 20%, not 14%, which is guaranteed by compensation. Uh, now, states uh, have been... Yeah. We have historically chosen a path of development. Now, now we are forced to derail from that. You know, suppose uh, I say, therefore, there should be flexibility in, G in the GST system. Suppose uh, a state like Kerala okay. wants to have a higher rate for consumer durables, they should be permitted to do so. Uh, you should not use mm. the majority to cut but down, what, slash down but, from but, a rate but doesn't which it, doesn't has it been, negate the, um, after But doesn't it negate the very needs. purpose of a GST, sir? But, but doesn't it negate the very purpose of the GST then if each state is going to have the no, flexibility it does, it does, to hike it rates it. as it, uh, it, as it. They, as it choose? No. Okay, I'll, you, you believe it doesn't. But I'll, I'll, let oh. me come back to you. We've also got no, Aditya Nair, inform principal economist at Ikra. I'll come back to you in let, just a second. I'll just come no, back no, to let you, me, sir. Let me, let me inform you. Mr. Isaac, give me, give me 30 seconds. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I must tell you, the time of empowered committee deliberations, which went on for uh, uh, about six years on GST, the general understanding was for the states, 
there would be a, a brand within which they could take the rates. It was a flexible system. Mm. In a complex country like India, with a region of so much diversities, it is important to have that federal flexibility. Now, after having reached an understanding okay. about a revenue neutral rate, you are unilaterally reducing the rates mm. and that to higher into the bracket, putting states which uh, have been tuned to certain level of spending into serious problem. Uh, therefore, right. it's not acceptable to me. No, okay. it's not. Okay. If you want to reduce the rate, abolish okay. the rate for the necessities. Then it will be free. Yeah. Okay, all right. Let me go across to Aditi Nair, Principal Economist at ICRA. Aditi, thanks very much for joining us. ICRA has put out a report uh, flagging concerns on the shortfall as far as indirect tax collections are concerned and the implications for state governments. We've got a GST Council meeting coming up on the 22nd, Aditi. Uh, and while uh, officials within the government seem to suggest that there is no elbow room for significant rate rationalization, the call from the Prime Minister is that the 28% bracket should be pruned even further. Uh, so... Now, you know, states are grappling with what could be the implications of that uh, for them. Uh, what's, what are your key concerns, Aditi, and what are your expectations? Thanks, Shireen. Um, the note that we put out today is actually highlighting the key risks that we see to the state's uh, fiscal health in FI19. And uh, the first one, as you mentioned, is the fact that uh, in terms of central tax devolution, we do expect that there could be a significant shortfall to the states because of two major indirect taxes of uh, the government of India. One is the CGST collections and the second is the cart and excise duty on fuels uh, that was instituted for H2 of uh, this fiscal. Now, um, interestingly, what we have observed is that in terms of the CGST and the SGST collections, first of all, the budget estimates made by the government of India and all the states put together are rather different. So while government of India has uh, put in a budget okay. estimate of CGST collections of $6 trillion, for this fiscal. Uh, if you look at the data for all states put together, mm. they actually budgeted a much more moderate 4.9 trillion. So firstly, uh, there is this okay. big difference in terms of the budget estimates. Secondly, uh, we have estimated okay. that uh, up to uh, the collections in November uh, 2018, uh, the CGST, after taking into mm. account the uh, normal settlement and the provisional settlement of IGST that has taken place so far, would be around 3 trillion which is just about mm. half of the center's budget estimates. On the other hand, our forecast okay. is that the states have been able to garner 3.4 trillion of uh, SCST after the IGST settlement, which is closer okay. to 70% of the 4.9 mm. trillion that they budgeted. So the risk really is that CGST okay. collections will fall short of Government of India's uh, estimate, and therefore central tax devolution would also be lower. But on the SGST side, we see the situation okay. being far more comfortable right now. Of course, if there are further GST rate cuts, then we'll have to assess whether that continues to be the case. Okay, so the key risk at this point in time is the central tax devolution that you foresee uh, on account of the uh, uh, fact that we haven't seen the collections being uh, coming in line with what the government uh, estimated. But let me go back across to Mr. Badal. Mr. Badal, uh, you know, we both, you as well as Mr. Isaac, seem to suggest that perhaps it would be more prudent to take a holistic picture as far as rate rationalization is concerned. And maybe this is not the time uh, for significant tweaking on the GST rate. But, you know, Ms. Isaac brought up that meeting that was chaired by Mr. Piyush Goyal. Rate rationalization was not on the agenda, yet we saw a plethora of rate cuts coming in. Is that the expectation then on the 22nd, given what we have seen from both the Prime Minister as well as the Finance Minister today, specifically on, on, on rates, sir? Well, uh, uh, Shireen, I just wanted to just bring this also up, that uh, if you look at last month's collection, I'm not sure it's about 97,000 crores. And out of 97,000 yeah. crores, it's uh, 7,000 would be refunds. So actually, you know, these figures actually inflated. So that brings it to 90,000 crores. Mm. And 8,000 crores would be compensation mm. to the states. So you're left with 82,000 crores. Mm. And uh, if you divide this equally mm. between uh, Government of India and all the state governments, so Government of India is left with 41,000 yep. crores. This is yeah. even less than what Government of India was collecting two years back in 15-16. In so we need to ramp up mm. the technology and you know, t put, t put technology in place where you know, people find it yeah. simpler to file taxes. I mean, you just look at the number of audits which are taking place. There is a... Yeah. Uh, 
there is a departmental audit, CAG audit, there is a 9C audit, special audit, there is an eBay bill. I mean, the trade and industry is actually suffering because okay. of this bad design. And so what, okay. what in the Congress party we are thinking, because you can't fix it. We have to go in for a GST too. That's what we are thinking. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Isaac, uh, uh, what is this GST2 going to be about? I, I, I am given to understand that uh, non-BJP states are likely to go into a huddle, perhaps even ahead of the GST Council meeting on the 22nd. We heard Mr. Badal talk about the need for fresh thinking. What could this GST2, what are the ideas that you bring to the table in terms of this GST2? Things are reaching a point where uh, we cannot allow this to continue in this manner. Look, December is past, getting past. But what is the situation? Since GST was ushered in, there has not been a single annual return. Without annual return, how do anybody mm. scrutinize uh, what is due to the government if somebody is taking extra input credit or not? Now, mm. there is only now 3B, GSTR 3B. Now, without the GSTR 2 yeah. and 3, how do we um, examine, scrutinize the return meaningfully? There is no system in place. Okay. Please, yes. heaven's sake, allow the system to settle okay. down somewhere before you go on tweaking the rates, changing the right. rates. And if there is any to be rate cut, okay. let it be discussed thoroughly. Revenue implications, let them work out the revenue implication. Hmm. How much is going to be hmm. Without doing that on a populist hmm. ground, you say, now that is too much, we are going to reduce it, we are going to reduce to 99%. Okay. That's not the structure we agreed to. So, I, I, it's okay. very sad All right. that DST Council is degenerating into this manner because of the ruling powers. Let me bring back uh, the finance minister of Punjab, Mr. Badal. Mr. Badal, you know, Punjab was one of the uh, state governments that announced the loan waiver, uh, loan waiver to the tune of about 10,000 crore rupees. Have you been able to deliver uh, completely on that? Substantially, uh, Shireen, we've been able to deliver. Um, and uh, like I was uh, talking to you before this program, uh, most uh, people would think that uh, agri uh, loan waivers are actually a dole or a subsidy or populist. But uh, in an agri powerhouse like mm. Punjab, we, we consider this as capital investment. Your party president now, Mr. Badal, is calling for a nationwide farm loan waiver. Uh, what he has said today uh, outside parliament is that they will put pressure on the government to announce a nationwide farm loan waiver, which takes me back to what the Congress had done, uh, the UPA had done in 2008 when uh, the UPA announced a debt waiver as well as a relief package amounting to about 71,680 crores. Uh, and, uh, you know, the loan waiver was to about 3.69 crore small and marginal farmers and there was a one-time settlement of loans for another 0 0.6 crore other farmers who didn't fall in the small and marginal farmer category. Do you support a nationwide uh, loan waiver? I feel that uh, budgets and um, economy and government should not just be about numbers and figures. It should also be about real people. Yeah. And if... Uh, if the people of, yes. you know, I may be a very strong man, but if, if, I, if my eye is paining, I, I cannot hope to be healthy. Mm. Similarly, if a large section yeah. of your population is distressed, then how does India hope to move ahead? Mm. So I, in fact, I was uh, yeah. uh, the architect no, of the I'm, Punjab Manifesto. I was the I'm one not, who wrote it. And we, we were the yes. first, we were the I'm pioneers. Not arguing, I'm not uh, arguing. And, uh, I, I, I'm not arguing about ab about the the need to to address the distress that uh, the agri economy faces, that India's farmers face. Uh, the point that I'm asking is a different one. Uh, if I look at your debt as a percentage of GDP, at 41 percent. Similar story for states like West Bengal, 37 percent; Kerala, 31 percent; Rajasthan, 33 percent; UP, 29 percent. My question is: Do you have the ability to write the checks that you're promising to write? Well, Punjab has uh, written it off, so we, we did write the check, and uh, the debt is something which is part of a, a legacy, which is something to do with uh, the state uh, of terrorism which prevailed in Punjab for a decade. It's also got to do uh, with uh, the slowdown of the economy on account of uh, uh, special concessions which were given to uh, the hill states, which are uh, Jammu Kashmir, Himachal, which are immediate neighbors of Punjab. So this is a legacy which we carry forward. But at the same time, as a government, we cannot 
uh, you know, I, you know, afford to see the farmers of Punjab in distress. I'm not saying loan waiver is the only solution. Yeah. Uh, it is part of it. So it has to be a multi-pronged right. approach. And uh, just the last word, I just hope, uh, I just wish that BJP had done it when the international oil prices were down and there was a windfall mm. profit which mm. the government mm. of India had. And if they, the two, three lakh crores, if they had done it, uh, not just agri farm loan uh, yeah. waiver, but also maybe uh, cheap, cheaper capital to small and medium industry, Indian economy would be on a much shorter footing. Right. Aditi, I'll, I'll give you the final word on this because while we have uh, uh, asked the government if there is such a plan at this point in time, officially uh, they say that there is no plan for a nationwide farm loan waiver. But the speculation is that maybe, uh, you know, even as early as the supplementary demand for grants, maybe there could be some indication. Uh, we don't know. This is speculation at this point in time. But reports suggest that to the tune of 4 lakh crore rupees, perhaps uh, that could be something that will be unveiled. What's your own estimate? See, we will have to obviously watch this very closely in terms of what is the total amount uh, of uh, loans that are uh, announced in terms of any waiver that actually gets announced, how many people per family would actually be uh, eligible for that, uh, what would be the source of uh, uh, the debt which is being uh, written off, whether it's only going to be from cooperative societies or from all types of banking uh, channels. Uh, is there a limit uh, that uh, would be applied uh, per person in terms of the amount uh, that would be uh, capped? And uh, then also the number of years over which the actual loan waiver by uh, any government, whether it's the central government or the state government, gets staggered. Right. So all of these obviously uh, factors will have an impact on what is the affordability in any given year and how much has to be foregone in terms of other mm. spending, uh, competing spending priorities that the government right. uh, may have. And uh, ultimately that is what will Im have an impact on the size of uh, the fiscal slippage in any given year. So a lot of things to watch out for before yeah, being able to really right. comment. Fact, just, uh, yes. And, 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 and as I point out, it is still speculation. It's a demand being made by the Congress party, by the Congress president. But the government says that there is no plan for a national farm loan waiver uh, at this point in time. And if I, again, if we go back to the waiver announced by the UPA in 2008, the debt waiver uh, was to be done by the 30th of June of 2008 and the debt relief package by 30th of June 2010. So as Aditi was saying, it is staggered. But uh, Mr. Badal, I'll give you the final word on the program now. Uh, what would be... Your single biggest concern, sir, as you look at both the economy as well as the political economy today? Well, I just want to end with a, a very famous couplet of uh, one of the greatest poets of the Indian subcontinent, Muhammad Iqbal. He says, Ki Khuda ne aaj tak us kaum ki halat nahi badli, na ho khayal jise khud apni halat ke badalne ka. So God is not going to change this for us. You know, we, we will have to... Uh, fix this, uh, uh, our tax. You know, it was a once in a century chance which India had. 160 countries yeah. had already gone into a GST regime. Uh, we just had to copy one of them and look what a mess we made of it. So we are looking and I'm, you know, I'm convinced that the government is on a, an election mode. They're not going to fix anything. So we're hoping mm. Congress forms the next government and we just try and, you know, clean up the stables. Mm. <laughs> All right, sir. Well, uh, hope is what the Congress is betting on at this point in time. And I guess with the electoral verdict in the three states, uh, that hope has certainly been bolstered, but the BJP thinks otherwise. Uh, we'll find out what the decisions are at the GST Council on the 22nd uh, the, uh, the, for this evening. Yes, well, sir. Uh, there's a colloquial wisdom in Punjab which says that one and one is actually 11. So I used to be one and then now I have three more colleagues in, as finance ministers. So we become a big group. <laughs> All right. Yes, certainly a bigger group in the GST Council with more Congress representation. Uh, Mr. Badal and Aditi Nair and Thomas Isaac, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18 to take stock of the two big statements that have come in on the political economy. Federal Reserve against a rate hike. Trump referred to a Wall Street Journal op-ed published titled Time for a Fed Pause. To drive home his point, he tweeted, and I quote, I hope the people over at the Fed will read today's Wall Street Journal editorial before they make yet another mistake. Also, don't let the market become any more illiquid than it already is. Stop with the 50 Bs and fail the market. Don't just go by meaningless numbers. Good luck. End of quote. 
Now, Trump's 50 Bs may refer to the Fed's current policy of reducing its bond holdings by a maximum of 50 billion per month. Now, his tweet came hours before the Fed starts a two-day meeting at which it's widely expected to raise interest rates. So what are the reasons for the recent sell-off in the American markets and what are the factors that spooked the Wall Street? What will exactly the Fed do after its two-day policy meeting? Steve Leisman joins us with the findings of the CNBC survey. Steve. We wanted to know the question of what really is bugging the market. So we put a bunch of things out there, tariff concerns, weak global economies, the Fed hiking rates. And we said, has this contributed a lot, somewhat or not at all to the recent market sell off? And 71 percent said tariffs were a lot. This does not add up to 100 because you could an any percentage could answer for each one of these questions. Right. Global weakness is in the number two spot of contributing a lot to the sell off, followed by the Fed and more rate hikes here. Earnings, and then look at the last position here. The, the least concern of all, the least contributor to the sell-off is weaker U.S. growth. So what do these guys think? This is a survey of 43 economists, strategists, and fund managers. 63% say the market is projecting too pessimistic an outlook for earnings and the economy in the next year. Just 27% say the market has a two rack, and only 7% say it's too optimistic, meaning there's more to go. So now take a look at the forecast here. And, uh, for th these guys have really they follow the market up and then they follow it down. This is a pretty big drop. 2774 is the estimate for the S&P 500 for 2019, followed by 2836 for 2020. But look, we've had this sell off here. So there's still 7 percent upside for next year if you go to this number here. Now, I want to show you the outlook for bond yields and tell you why that's important. Not because these guys are right. Notice they were looking for a three and a half percent 10 year yield by the end of 2019 through most of this past year here. And now they've come way down. It's not important what they think. What's important here is the amount of easing that is now in the mind of the market. They were looking for three and a half. Now they're only looking for just above 3%, and the current 10-year yield is just north of 280. Okay, let me show you the top line results before we go here. Pretty good percentage now looking for a rate hike in December, 98%, and that's up from our November survey. But look at what's happened. Again, the easing in the mind of the market, less ra fewer rate hikes. 1.8 is now the average of those, which tells you that pretty much everybody agrees on one. And then more agreement towards two. But look at what it was. It was a debate between two or three. And now that debate has shifted. And looking for less than one hike in 2020. Carl, all of this is online, all the results, if you want to see some of the commentary and some of the detailed results. But ultimately, we're looking for a hike tomorrow. And then for the Fed, those forecasts of the Fed to come down for 2019 and beyond. All right, Steve, thank you very much for bringing us that report. Now, as investors await the U.S. Fed's rate decision, Wall Street is in the green. The Dow, the S&P and the Nasdaq are all trading with strong gains on your screen right now. Now, the other big global headline that we're tracking for you today, China's President Xi Jinping has taken a defiant stance against demands that China change the way its economy functions. Now, speaking at an event marking the 40th anniversary of the opening up of the Chinese economy, President Xi said that China has the right to pursue its own path and choose its reforms as it will. CNBC's Emily Tan filed this report earlier today. China marked the 40th anniversary of reform and opening up, and in his 90-minute address to the nation from the Great Hall of the People, President Xi Jinping said today is an important day well remembered, as it marks a major turning point in history. And in the commemoration, they are gathered to review and take stock. She said reform and opening up is a great revolution of Chinese people and the nation, propelling a quantum leap in socialism with Chinese characteristics. China has turned from a closed country to one embracing an all-around opening up. It is exactly 40 years to the day that Deng Xiaoping opened a Communist Party conclave that launched China's reform and opening up. This was a highly anticipated speech from President Xi Jinping, but there were no new specific measures announced, only to say that this will be a long process and each step of the reform process will not be easy. We have introduced more than 1,600 reform initiatives cracked many hard nuts and navigated through dangerous currents. Reform is going deeper across the board in a swift but steady manner with breakthroughs on multiple fronts. 
President Xi quoted Mao Zedong saying, if we don't make reforms now, modernization will be doomed. He also made reference to Deng Xiaoping and former presidents Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. President Xi came to power in 2013 and initiated his anti-corruption campaign. He went on to say that the government will resolutely clean up corruption. The speech comes amid mounting pressure for China to accelerate reforms amid a trade war with the U.S. and the impact that's having on the Chinese economy. She said no one is in the position to dictate to Chinese people what should and should not be done. But there was no immediate reference to the United States. The commemoration ceremony also included the awarding of Reform Pioneer Medals, those who have made great contribution. Of the many acknowledged included Lee Kuan Yew, the first Prime Minister of Singapore, Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum, Chinese basketball superstar Yao Ming, and the executive chairman of Alibaba, Jack Ma, alongside that of Tencent Pony Ma. I'm Emily Tan in Hong Kong. Back to you. Well, in other global news, Manchester United sacked their manager Jose Mourinho today and this move comes after United's worst start to the English Premier League in 28 years. Now, after 17 games, Manchester United is languishing at the sixth position in the table with zero goal difference. The club has also announced that they will appoint a caretaker manager for the remainder of the season. He, remember, is the third manager to be sacked by the club in just the last five years. From football to cricket then, auctions for the 2019 Indian Premier League have concluded just a short while back. And like always, there were surprises in store with two uncapped players. Varun Chakravarti and Shivam Dubey saw their rank bank balance shoot up suddenly. Varun, a star in the last edition of the Tamil Nadu T20 League, got a whopping 8.4 crores and was thus the costliest buy along with Jaydev uh, Unatkat. Now, all-rounder Shivam Dubey from Mumbai also saw tense bit and was eventually sold for 5 crore rupees. Young English all-rounder Sam Curran got a 7.2 crore rupees for joining the Royal Challengers Bangalore. Some other big names did not fare that well uh, throughout though. Uh, Yuvrat Singh was picked up by Mumbai Indians in the second round of bidding at his base price of 1 crore rupees. Dale Stephen, Cheteshwar Pujara, Brendan McCullen, Chris Wokes, Alex Hales and Chris Jordan went unsold. IDFC Bank is now IDFC First Bank and the merger with Capital First is a done deal. And there are some significant management changes that have been announced as well. For instance, V. Vedyanathan has been named the MD and CEO of this combined entity. Remember, he was the MD and CEO of Capital First. And the MD and CEO of IDFC Bank, that is Rajiv Lal, will now be a part-time non-executive chairman of uh, IDFC First Bank, that is the new entity. Uh, there are also some board-level changes with Brinda Jagidar, Himang Raja, Vishal Mahadevia, Ashish Kamath and Desh Dogra being announced as independent directors for a period of five years on the board of the new bank. There have also been some resignations from Rajan Anandan uh, and others. But do remember, uh, Pankaj uh, Sanklecha is now the new CFO of the combined entity and he would also be heading uh, the corporate centre at the new bank. Uh, it is a win-win for both IDFC Bank and Capital First. IDFC Bank are finally getting a larger share of the retail portfolio that the bank has been chasing uh, since its inception. Retail will now be over 32% of the combined book of both of these entities. Uh, for Capital First, on the other hand, it will finally realize its dream of becoming a bank. Uh, do remember the equity uh, swap will take place on the 31st of December where each shareholder will get 139 shares of IDFC Bank for every 10 shares that they hold of Capital First. Now here is a CNBC TV 18 exclusive that we've been tracking from the Deal Street. We learn from sources that Rakesh Shunjanwala may reduce his proposed investment in Star Health. Now do remember Safe Crop Holdings, which is a consortium of Chunjanwala, Bestbridge and Madison Capital, had bid for Star Health at 6,500 crore rupees. Let's go across to Yash Chen for more details on this development. Yash, uh, take us through what you've picked up. So, Ritu, uh, two very major impediments have hit this particular transaction when it comes to acquisition of Star Health Insurance. Talking about the first one, uh, one of the investors in the consortium, that is Rakesh Junjunwala, has decided essentially to reduce the capital commitment which he was willing to make at the time of signing the def definitive agreement when it comes to acquiring Star Health Insurance. We are given to understand that this has happened uh, due to some discrepancy when it comes to the first and the second quarter FY19 results uh, and financial performance 
performance of Star Health Insurance. Now, just to take you through the contours of this deal, essentially the deal is valued at 6,500 crore rupees. Uh, sources back then had indicated that Rakesh Junjunwala would be holding approximately 39% uh, stake in Star Health Insurance. And according to that calculation, the amount he which he was supposed to pay would be around 2,300 to 2,500 crore rupees. That amount we are given to understand is uh, expected to be reduced uh, lower. Now, what that essentially has given rise to the second impediment, which is essentially creation of a vacuum when it comes to that entire deal valuation of 6,500 crore. Another source here has indicated that uh, the consortium itself, which is Safe Crop Holdings, will look to renegotiate and reconsider that 6,500 crore valuation and bring that figure also uh, downwards. Uh, we don't know what will be the ultimate reduced uh, valuation of this particular deal. But one thing is certain that the entire timeline of this particular transaction, which uh, one was expecting, will certainly get stretched from uh, what was initially stated by the management. All right, Yash, thank you very much for reporting one of those mega deals in the insurance space. Now, here's the CNBC TV 18 special. India's fastest train, Train 18, is set to be launched soon on the new Delhi Varanasi route. This engine less train, which has been developed indigenously, has breached the speed of 180 kilometers per hour in its trial runs. Anu Sharma caught up with Sudhanshu Manu, uh, Mani, who is the general manager of the Integral Coach Factory, the manufacturer of the semi high speed train. Here is what he had to say about the railway's plans for train 18. When we design a train for 160 kilometers per hour, it has to be tested at 10% higher speed. That's why we tested the train at 180 kilometers per hour, uh, marginally above 180, so it surpassed 180, ran very well. But still, it will be cleared for 160 kilometer per hour operation number one. Uh, when it's, uh, if it is introduced on uh, Delhi Varanasi sector, up to Allahabad, the speed is uh, uh, limit is 130 and later it's 110 or 120. We are also talking about the little sister of train 18, uh, the uh, mainline electric unit, which is uh, meant for short and medium travel. Uh, how many such units can we expect in the current financial year and the next year? And how many more of uh, train 18s and similar kind of train? Uh, we are planning to make two more in this financial year and eight, seven or eight more next financial year. That's train 18. Because the trial was done by RDSO in a record time and it is now almost ready for commercial service. Well, it is a great time to be an online streaming business and the market is wide open. Original content is also abundant. But for rivals Netflix and Amazon Video, the battle has only just begun. CNBC TV 18's Jude Sanit has more details in this report. Personalization, that's the buzzword at Netflix as it takes its service one step further in providing an enhanced user and viewer experience and one that it says is paying dividends. And we pay attention to what people watch and based on what they've watched before, we show them relevant content that we think they're going to enjoy. We try many images for each title and then we personalize. Not only do we put the right titles in front of you, but we put the right images to represent those titles. With Amazon Prime Video and Netflix locked in a head-to-head -head battle for market share, personalization, it seems, could well be the key differentiator between both players. So the secret to winning this race could well lie in how both portals use algorithms to tell each of their millions of viewers which shows or films they're likely to enjoy on an individual level. Data analysis by Netflix shows that each viewer looks at nearly 50 titles before deciding what to watch. With personalized content displays, the portal now hopes viewers can make their picks quicker and so stay longer. Rival Amazon Prime Video is no stranger to the personalization strategy and claims its recommendation engines are as good as Netflix's. Maybe because incidentally, Netflix runs on Amazon's cloud storage tool, AWS. But Amazon says personalization won't amount to much if flexibility and speed aren't top-notch. Netflix, in general, material that comes out except it is their homegrown products, that takes a lot longer. They don't have the newest video because they have a subscription model. In the case of Amazon Video, for example, next to Amazon Prime, which is a subscription space, um, you can get the newest movies if you just pay $4. Both Netflix and Amazon Prime Video, of course, downplay their rivalry and say there's ample room to grow, especially in newer markets like India. 
but that's not stopping them from spending on improving user experience and that's a big win for the customer. In Las Vegas, Jude Sanat. The World Economic Forum has released its Gender Gap Report for 2018. And this report shows that the gender parity across the world has stagnated, especially when it comes to participation of women in the workforce and politics. Now, according to this report at the current rate, it will take 108 years to achieve gender parity across different sectors. And when it comes to participation of women in the workforce, it will take 202 years to close the gender gap. Also, India's ranking has remained unchanged at 108 this year. This, as wage equality for similar work, has improved and tertiary education gaps closed for the first time. However, progress has lagged on health and survival sectors. Now, the other key highlight from the report is that India has been ranked 60 slots below Bangladesh, which has been ranked 48, topping the list in South Asia. Now, a year after sweeping over Hollywood, the Me Too movement made its way into India in October of this year. Actors, filmmakers, corporates, politicians and even journalists were called out on social media for allegedly sexually harassing and assaulting women. Now, in a matter of weeks, Me Too had moved from being a hashtag on social media to a common topic of discussion even offline. CNBC TV 18's Kevin Lee and Parikshit Lutra report on the imprint that India's Me Too movement left on the year gone by. Twenty seventeen was when the Harvey Weinstein scandal hit the headlines. The Hollywood producer was accused of sexual assault by not one but several actresses, and Me Too started trending globally. Come 2018, and Me Too made national headlines back home. Nana Patekar's behavior on the set was, uh, you know, he misbehaved on the set. He was being very uh, aggressive. He was pushing me around. I complained about him. My complaint was not heard. Then he demanded to do an uh, intimate step with me on top of it. The spotlight was on Bollywood when actress Tanushree Datta accused Nana Patekar of sexual harassment on the sets of a movie in 2008. Subsequently, she filed an FIR. This wasn't the last. Actor Alok Nath, director Sajid Khan, comedian Utsav Chakravarti and director Vikas Bell were also accused of sexual harassment. As Bollywood grappled with Me Too allegations, brand consultant Suhail Seth and author Chetan Bhagat were also accused of sexual harassment. While the Me Too movement caused many heads to roll across professional circles, the sphere of politics was also hit hard. Veteran journalist, author and union minister MJ Akbar was the biggest name to face allegations. It started with journalist Priya Ramani on Twitter, who shared her story about MJ Akbar and quickly found support from at least 20 other journalists. The BJP and the centre were silent for a week after the allegations surfaced, with some in the government saying that the accusations did not pertain to his tenure as minister. Akbar's position, though, soon became impossible to defend and the PMO finally asked him to step down as minister. However, Akbar has filed a case of criminal defamation against Priya Ramani, which is being heard in a Delhi court. While many who spoke out are still to get justice, 2018 will be remembered as a year where sexual harassment at the workplace became an important topic of discussion. With Parikshit Luthra in Delhi, in Mumbai, Kevin Lee. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the world's largest philanthropic organization, sees immense potential in India's progress in meeting the sustainable development goals on healthcare as well as sanitation. Now, with its innovative toilet project underway, Mark Sozman, the global head of advocacy and the head of strategy for the foundation, spoke to CNBC TV18's Archana Shukla about the need for innovative solutions in India. Listen in to what he had to say. The other part which you're referring to is what we've been calling internally the Gates Foundation, the so-called reinvented toilet. The toilet yeah. So uh, what Bill Gates, we recently hosted a big expo in China just a, a month or so ago, which is tried right model saying the long-term future of sanitation has to be non-piped sanitation, so not the original. So can you get cheap, effective, new kinds of toilets that don't use water, but that do meet all the basic needs we have? And can we make them commercially viable at scale? What we have is some great prototypes, hmm. we're testing out. 
We're in active discussions with commercial partners, including a commercial partner here in India, where we hope that this is we would license the technology to try and have them commercialize it at scale. Mm. And then the hope is those models will be something that we'll be able to roll out in the coming years. And yes, India will be absolutely central to that. Bill Gates had said that the market could be as big as uh, $60 billion in the next few years as far as the entire toilet project is concerned. Uh, how much of that do you think could be pushed by India? Well, obviously, we're optimistic that a great deal of it could be pushed in that way. Some of that will depend on the partnerships. You know, we would do, and this is the nature of how philanthropy works, we will help develop the prototypes which we've done. Mm. We will try and seek out the partners. Part of the commercialization agreements is we will have sort of mandatory links there that we want to make sure that there will be availability needs for the poorest uh, built in because that is our mandate. Uh, but then it's actually going to be on the take up, on governments uh, being willing to sort of purchase and think about how you use these at scale. Our hope is you can do these in a phased way. They're first probably going to be most useful at community level toilets for schools or other communities where you are building multiple uh, mm -hmm. units and then will become more viable as units for individual household use. Uh, but again, this is the magic of when you can match the private sector against some of these new technologies for public good mm -hmm. and then you can have the government incentivize that through some programs and purchasing programs, uh, then very good things can happen. All right, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business Hour. Thank you for watching and have a good night.